Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Campbell. I work with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, and I'm here in Newburn. And uh, hopefully you're here for a frog workshop. If not, you press the wrong button, I think. But uh, <laughs> um, I'm in the education division. Uh, at, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things we do in a little bit. But uh, also with this is the Joe Master himself. Jeff, you want to say something, Jeff? <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, your, your mic was getting garbled there for just a second, Mike, but, okay. uh, uh, uh yes. Yeah, so my name is Jeff Hall. I'm also with the wildlife commission. I'm in the wildlife diversity program, which is part of the, uh, wildlife, uh, management division. And within the wildlife management division, we have lots of different staff that do lots of different things, but the wildlife diversity program focuses on primarily non-game species. So that's one of the other names that our program has had through the years. Uh, I specifically work with reptiles and amphibians in a statewide capacity, although we also have some regional people uh, in different parts of the state. And uh, so uh, Mike and I have been doing workshops like this for uh, probably close to 20 years now, Mike, uh, not all of that with the commission. Uh, prior to working with the commission, I was in an environmental education role at a facility. And so we were also doing workshops there at that time. So, yeah, that's probably enough about me, Mike. OK, um, well, I guess welcome, everyone. I hope everybody gets outside soon. Um, as Jeff said, normally when we do these uh, work type of workshops, we'll spend part of the day, whether it's on just on frogs or other reptiles and amphibians, and then we'll go out in the field and actually try to either hear some in the case of frog calls. We normally do these uh, when we wind up uh, usually right at dusk and get outside. Um, that can't happen today. So we're going to try to put some audio in so you can learn not only the uh, physical ID of or field ID of the frogs, but also some of the songs uh, or calls that they use. And uh, we might have some tests involved too. So uh, I want to show you some things that I hope everybody got. It's those handouts that I sent when you registered for the workshop. And uh, Jeff, can you see that? Yep, sure can. Okay, Just let me go over some of these just very quickly. Uh, you should have received the, the distribution map of frogs and toads in North Carolina. Uh, as I said in the response letter, there was no need to uh, print out many of these, but uh, I just want to show you a couple of things. And Jeff, you can uh, highlight this because I'm going to try to expand the field a little bit. I don't think I can, but you want to mention, because I was trying to get it closer so you could see the difference between the enclosed circles versus just the the circles that aren't completely black. You want to mention that quickly? Because I think sure. we're going to see those better on, on the presentation. Sure. If you look up at the top of your screen too, Mike, there's a little hand and then two to the right of the hand is a plus sign. That will make the thing bigger. Okay. If you want to. Yeah, I don't. There you go. Is that big enough? Okay. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, so these are maps that are maintained by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and they're a little different than what you might get from a typical range map in a field guide where you have an entire area that's just all grayed in, and that's all places that the animal could be. These maps, on the other hand, show specific locations that represent actual documented locations of, of the animal. And so in the case of the solid circles, those are uh, represented by a specimen that's somewhere in a museum, not necessarily the North Carolina Museum, could be somewhere else. The hollow circles, which there aren't as many of those on these maps, so if you're not noticing them, that's one reason why. There's just a few of those. Those, are, or there are fewer of those, those represent uh, observations of a species without necessarily a specimen. Yeah, on the green tree frog, you can see a fair number of those right around the middle right where Mike's mouse is. Um, so those are our observational records that aren't supported with a specific specimen. They're usually supported with either a photograph or they were uh, recorded by a professional herpetologist or something like that, someone that knows. So maybe if I was to report a record to the museum uh, that I didn't uh, collect the animal, which I rarely collect animals these days, it would be a, a hollow circle like that. So uh, that's what these maps are for. 
Uh, one important thing while we're looking at the green tree frog, you notice that there are counties without a tree frog, without a record, even within that range. And actually what strikes me, Mike, is Pitt County, where I live, <laughs> See that. that possible, does not have a green tree frog um, record in it. Now, does that mean green tree frogs aren't there? No, it doesn't. It just means no one has ever specifically gone and looked and collected a record for that county. And one of the nice things about these maps and why we chose to, to share these with you instead of the range maps is that this can help encourage you if you see the county that you live in and you notice a species that you've seen before is in your county and hasn't been documented there, that can encourage you to go out and try to document that species. And you can document it two different ways. Uh, well, uh, several different ways, but two different pieces of information that you could document it by. One would be if you take a recording of the call, that would serve as a, a voucher, or you can take a photograph of the animal. So either one of those would serve as a voucher for that for that creature. You can do that by sending it to um, um, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, or you can uh, actually record it yourself through something called Herp Mapper, and that's an online database. We'll talk about that in just a minute. There's some crossover between this and our websites, but that gives you a little bit of background into these maps, and uh, you have these for all 30 species. We're gonna talk about 31 species today, and uh, it'll be made clear why there's one maybe that's not on here right now. It's a little bit newer to our state. And also, Jeff, if they'll notice that this is 2003, yeah, uh, many of the species, which we'll talk about, uh, they're expanding their range a little more. So just keep in mind, this is uh, a little outdated information. OK, um, an another document that uh, I want to show you is the phenology. That is uh, the calling times for frogs and toads of North Carolina. And this is something that Jeff's put together. And there's actually uh, two or three of them in here. Uh, that deal with what time of the year is the optimum time for frogs to be calling. Uh, you can see in this one uh, that uh, there is some overlap. Uh, this is the more times that you're more likely to hear them, but they can be heard at other times in the year. In fact, some a couple of species, they can be heard just about any time of the year. So if you hear something out in your at your park or at your house, you can refer back to one of these uh, phenology maps and just get an idea of what you might be hearing. But keep in mind, there is, uh, in, in several of them, there's a lot of leeway in what time of the year they're calling. Um, another thing that you were sent, uh, let's see, that one, is a wildlife profile. We have these on our website at ncwildlife.org under species and, um, or learning and then under species. This is the Southern Leopard Frog. Uh, there are lots of great information. Uh, it gives a range map in North Carolina, you know, the habitats uh, and uh, human interactions. Also at the very bottom of this, uh, we'll talk more about this when we get to toads. This is actually a plate from uh, Peterson's Field Guides to Reptiles and Amphibians. And um, we, especially when it comes to toads, we have four species in North Carolina. This is all of Eastern North America right here, but we have four in North Carolina, which we'll talk about. Uh, this is probably the best way to identify them, um, and it has to do with the cranial crest near the paratoid glands, but we'll get more information about that. But you have that uh, on the backside of the wildlife profiles. All right. Um, a few more things. Uh, Jeff, you want to talk about these, and uh, then I'll mention the last one that I asked them to, to run off. Yeah, so I gave you a, uh, a selection of websites. Uh, this is by no means exhaustive of sites that, that you might find useful, but, but these are some pretty good ones, and they include a variety that, that have specific things related to uh, frogs and toads. So I work with, I coordinate the North Carolina Chapter of Partners on Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, so you can find that link at the top there. Just as a side, we're not really gonna talk a lot about that today, but we have a, a calling amphibian survey program, CASP, that is part of a North Carolina survey tool uh, for inventorying frogs and toads across the state. And you can access information about the CASP program through the NC Park website. Just look under uh, volunteering or things to do or something like that. 
and you'll find CASP information and CASP volunteer information. And so if you're interested in actually taking on a frog call route, uh, Mike has one, I have one, lots of people uh, that know their frogs and toads have one. That is an important piece. You do need to learn or know your frogs and toads. Um, but you can, you can uh, send me an email later uh, and I can give you more information about that, that program. Uh, herpsofnc.org is a really nice website uh, that NC Park has taken ownership of that helps you with, uh, it's an online field guide for the species in the state. And one of the nice things about the frog and toad section is that it also includes MP3s of all of the uh, species. I can't remember if you can download them or not. You may be able to, uh, not certain. Uh, but, you know, if you're not sure about that or not sure how to do it, my joke is, you know, find like a five or six year old kid and ask them and they probably know how to do it better than we do. So, <laughs> um, Hurt Mapper, I talked about that a little bit already, so I'll skip that. Frog quizzes. So there's lots of different places online where you can you can learn about frog calls and that you can you can gain information. Um, you'll see just down a little bit further down. Uh, Frog Calls website, Frogs and Toads of Georgia. There's some downloadable things there as well. But scroll back up, Mike. Just stay where you were. Okay, so that USGS Frog Quizzes one is one that once you've already kind of learned a little bit, there's a, a quiz page. So you can choose uh, to take a quiz, just choose public quiz. I don't think any of the other quizzes are functioning at the moment. So you choose public quiz and then you choose your state, North Carolina, and then you will have a, a series. I think it's 10 questions and yeah. it's different every time they use a randomizer and it plays a, a sequence and you're supposed to tick off all the species that you hear in that recording. And then it shows you on the next page uh, which ones were actually in the recording. So you kind of self self uh, test yourself. It's really, really a helpful program. So if you haven't found that before, definitely check that one out. Um, lots of other good uh, uh, websites on these two pages. I did check them recently and they were all working, but if for whatever reason they're not working anymore, uh, please do send me a note and let me know that and, uh, and we can um, uh, correct that. One last one I'll mention is that there are some good resources uh, Mike, if you'll scroll back up a little bit, uh, right there, yeah. Uh, so some other good resources if you're looking for books uh, to help you with your identification. There is one, North Carolina Frogs and Toads. That's the one there, Frogs and Toads of North Carolina. Um, and then that, that book by Lang Elliott uh, of North America is a really beautiful book. It's sort of a coffee table, larger thing. And... Uh, <clears throat> Both of those uh, have CDs of all the species calling. Now, of course, the Lang Elliott one is all of North America, so it's going to be a lot more species. The North Carolina one is just our 30 species. So uh, I think that's all I was going to mention about that. Mike, anything you had? No, that, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you is, is what I mentioned that you may be interested in printing out. This might help today for two reasons. One is we put mnemonics on here. Um, if you're not familiar with mnemonics, it's a, it's a way for you can sort of help you remember what, in this case, what frogs sound like. For instance, one of the first species we want to deal with are the cricket frogs, and it literally sounds like marbles clicking. Uh, a lot of the chorus frogs sound like you're rubbing a, your thumb across a, a, a comb. So we came up with these years ago. It's always interesting for people to... Uh, let us know what they think it sounds like. For instance, uh, I remember years ago we had uh, a, a, a young man in our class and he said, that sounds like a sheep. And so I think we included the sheep bleeding in here. So uh, you can put your own mnemonic there, but also when we start doing some field identification of these, there's places in there, if you did run it off, you can write notes uh, to kind of help you uh, remember uh, you know, some of the physical characteristics of, of frogs. So. Uh, if you didn't run them off, that's fine, but that's one that it might help you today if you did, just to, for notes and when we do the, the quizzes there towards the end of the, uh, in the, end of the class. A um, couple of things, uh, and then I'm going to take my ugly mug off the camera. I'm going to get out of share screen and... Um, um, 
Okay, how's that? Are we back to normal, Jeff? Yep, you're good. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thanks to Mallory Henderson. She was our gatekeeper today. Uh, um, that we're, we're sort of limited on the number of people, and that's why we ask you to make sure you uh, are able to log in. Uh, Jeff, I think we've got 44 now. Um, and if you don't know, this is our second one. We actually did one last week, and it filled up in a really short amount of time. So we, we're going to do this again. Uh, it is recorded. Uh, we'll let you know uh, how you can find it in uh, uh, later on, and uh, you might be able to view it. Uh, but one thing that I like about doing these in real time instead of watching a recorder is we like lots of interaction. We had some great questions last week. So if you would, with this many people, if you would keep your uh, mic muted. But if you scroll, and if you're not familiar with Teams, Jeff mentioned this before a lot of you got online. If you scroll around at the bottom, uh, uh, a bar might come up. And if you click on uh, one that looks like a note page, it says show conversation. You can click on that and you can type questions in and I will be monitoring that and, and pass them on to Jeff because Jeff's going to be full screen. So uh, please, please, please ask questions. Uh, we would prefer that if you have specific questions about maybe what's in your backyard or if you want to talk at the end of this, Jeff and I can stick around till you know, two or three o'clock if we need to. If you have specific questions or comments about something that you may have seen or heard, uh, please just wait till the end. But if you want to know something about that particular slide at the moment, please type it in and I'll pass it on to Jeff. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Uh, if everybody understands how to do that, uh, please, please ask questions, make it interactive. That's what makes these things uh, uh, really click uh, in these type of workshops. So Jeff, did you, want to did you want to show them that magazine, Mike? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, this is the agency that Mallory and 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 Jeff and I work for, uh, and I think there's some other staff members that I see that have joined us. But uh, in the January issue, Jeff actually wrote a great article on gopher frogs, and uh, Jeff has gotten permission from Josh Leventhal, our editor, to share the PDFs. So at the end of today, I'm going to send everybody a PDF of the um, of the gopher frog article. We'll talk a lot about gopher frogs there. Uh, Jeff and his crew are doing some great stuff with it. So I will send that out as soon as we are finished today. OK. Sounds good. All right. All right. So. Yeah, so we're here to talk about frogs today. You can see my screen, I'm hoping, Mike. Yes, yes, good. All right, good stuff. So uh, we will cover uh, all the species. Uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you get people ask, you know, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and uh, occasionally there'll be quizzes here and there. And if you don't pass your quiz, then we never let you off this webinar. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is the, the third grade question, you know, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? So you might give that third grader a different kind of answer than what we'll talk about today. Frogs and toads, those terms are really common name type terms. And what you'll find is when we delve into the families of the frogs and toads found in North Carolina and North America and the world, is that sometimes you have animals that have the common name frog that are in a family that's mostly frogs, and sometimes it's in a family that's mostly toads. And sometimes you have the opposite, where you have an animal that looks like a frog, but has toad attached to it. So there's there's some uh, back and forth, but you know that that same answer that we might give is that generally frogs have smoother, moister skin. Toads tend to be rougher, bumpier, wartier skin, but that doesn't always hold true. Frogs and toads are both part of a group called anurans for the order anura. So if you want to be completely correct, instead of worrying about whether it's frogs and toads, you can just say anurans. But no one will know what you're talking about. So <laughs> uh, all toads are frogs because frogs is the larger group, but not all frogs are toads. So now that you're all completely confused about what we're talking about today, <laughs> Uh, they are all tied to aquatic environments, at least to some degree. All of our North Carolina species are. That's not true for every frog around the world. We might mention that just a little bit. And then they are important components of systems. 
as you see that uh, southern toad being eaten by an eastern uh, hognose snake on the right side of the screen there. So uh, all of our species in North Carolina employ this breeding technique. Uh, definitely some species around the world do not have this because there are uh, there's a fairly large family that uh, has a direct development where the adults lay eggs and the eggs hatch into tiny versions of the adults so they don't have an aquatic larval stage but all of our 31 species do um, so typically you'll start out with this calling animal and it's the males that do the the, the vast majority of any of the calling so when you see uh, a photograph like this you know that's a male frog uh, females do actually make sounds both males and females uh, of a lot of species when they are fleeing from a predator will make this um, alarm call, sort of a eep! kind of a sound as they're hopping in the water, especially a lot of the ranted frogs, the bullfrog-like frogs uh, do that, both male and female. But in terms of the true calling that we hear uh, either sometimes in the day, but frequently at night, uh, that is principally the males calling or only the males calling. Uh, that causes uh, females to be attracted to the male and then uh, the male will hold on to the female that's the male on top there and the female underneath is the females the larger one generally with many species of frogs the females are are larger and that's to accommodate those eggs that she's going to deposit once she deposits the eggs the male will externally fertilize those uh, in the water they hatch out into tadpoles those tadpoles eventually you know, grow four legs, exchange gills for lungs, and hop out on the ground as, as a young metamorph or a, a young a froglet, a juvenile frog, and the cycle is all started again. Uh, there's actually a term for when you have the male frog holding on to the female frog, and that's amplexus. Some frogs, there's actually some secretions that the male frog uh, has in his front uh, feet that allow him to, to grasp and hold on to the female even more. And there's some details about the placement of his arms, whether his his hands or arms or front feet, front legs, whatever, are just behind the front legs of the female or whether they're just in front of the rear legs. So that that comes up to these these terms here, but we won't we won't spend a lot of time on that. So I've mentioned there's some discrepancy of how many species we have. Uh, in North Carolina, historically, we have had as many as 31 species. So the new species that, that ticks us up to 31 is the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. We won't spend much time talking about it today, but it's a relatively newly described species within the last five years or so. And it is found in a few counties in the northeast corner of our state, northeast corner of the coastal plain. Uh, but uh, that's what's taken us up to 31 instead of the 30 that's normally recognized in most books. However, one of those 30, the river frog, has not been seen in the state in over 30 years. And so it's likely that our true today picture of how many species live in our state is probably back to 30 species. We've added one and we've lost one. But we're going to be considering the historical context today, so 31 species. You can see they're broken up into five families. And we're not going to get too hung up on taxonomy today, but it is uh, helpful to view these species within their taxonomic groups because they share characters that can help you identify them later on in the field. So we have two families where there's only one species that we have in the state, uh, Palobatidae and Microhylidae. And then we have these other three larger families, the Hylidae family, which is our largest uh, family, 16 species. And then you can see Ranidae with nine and Bufonidae with four. So we'll talk about those and the, the uh, frogs that are representative from each of those families. Any uh, questions yeah, so far, Mike? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Bob and Mike, we'll get to your question a little bit later. I think it'd be a better time. But Heather asked if the male fertilizes the eggs externally, why do the males need to hold on to the females? Ah, great question. So they want to know which female it is that they're fertilizing, I suppose. So what can happen, I'll go back here, what can happen is that you have males that call, but not all the males call. So calling is very energetically expensive, and so you'll have uh, probably the vast majority of the males are calling, but you'll have these other males that are satellite males, and they don't really call. What they do is they 
maybe they aren't as good a caller or they uh, are just smarter. I don't know. <laughs> but what they do is they, they lay in wait basically near a frog that's calling. Right. They're not calling. They're waiting for a female to come up to that frog. And when the female comes up, they may jump in and grab that female before the actual calling male has a, has a chance to grab them. So they're kind of a, a kind of cheating a little bit. Uh, but that's sort of two strategies, right? So you can either be a good caller and you attract a female that way, or maybe you're not a great caller. So maybe you try to employ another technique. You get near a male that's calling well and try to grab that female. So once you grab that female, she's going to move away to different parts of the pond. So it's to, to lay those eggs. So if you didn't hold on to her, you'd have to just swim around randomly in the pond and hope you found an egg mass that was either not already uh, fertilized or that um, the female was still depositing, you know, something like that. And so if the male holds on to that female, then he is sure that he's going to be the one fertilizing the eggs that she deposits. So that's that's kind of the way that rolls. Okay, Jeff, uh, just quickly, um, Stacy mentioned, I've watched toads breeding in a frenzy and there was a lot of knocking each other away. Is that what you were referring to? Uh, that's a little different, but yes, that certainly happens too. Uh, you'll have males fighting over females. You will also have in that very situation, Stacy. you'll have multiple males actually clasping onto one another. And so that's an there's another call that male frogs can make that says, uh, get off me, pal. I'm another boy <laughs> because you'll have you, you can sometimes even have a chain of like three or four males all sort of locked onto one another. And the one in the front starts making a different kind of a sound that lets the one know that's holding on. Oh, wait, you're another male, too. So they let go and move off and look for a female. Because when you get those big frenzies like that, bunches of frogs in one place, uh, then then you can absolutely have some some uh, miscommunication, we might say, some confusion. And so um, that that call will allow them to know you've got the wrong you've got the wrong thing going on here. You need to find a girl. So uh, that that does work in the frog world. OK, another question uh, from Chrissy was the what was the frog called that hasn't been seen in 30 years? I think, Jeff, I don't know if you mentioned it was River Frog. Uh, yep. The river that was frog. down in the Lumber River Basin. Um, I mean, they're still found in South Carolina, but it's just North Carolina. So it is yeah. River Frog. Yeah, it's still found in other parts of its southeastern range, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. But for whatever reason, uh, we haven't been able to detect it in North Carolina anymore. It's an interesting species, but I'm, I'm not going to get us too sidetracked on it. Okay. And Jan had mentioned, I can't, cannot see the presentation. I assume other people can, so I'm not sure what's going on. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I don't really know, but uh, I think most every, everybody else seems to be able to do it. Okay, Jeff. All right. Sorry about that, Jan. Uh, it may be a device issue or a bandwidth issue or 50 other different things it could be. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, we are going to hopefully have this available later on. So if you're not able to see anything and you prefer to, to hop off, uh, we can send you the link later for, for this presentation. So apologize for that. OK, so let's jump into some of these families. I'm going to start with the, the largest one and work our way down. Uh, the tree frog group, Hylidae, uh, includes, uh, as I mentioned before, 16 species. We'll break those down into smaller groups. So we have the cricket frogs on this slide. Uh, there are two species in North Carolina and then the chorus frogs. And we have about seven species of chorus frogs in the state, even though not all of them have chorus frog in their name, like spring peeper and little grass frog. They all share the same genus, which is Pseudacris. These guys, cricket frogs are acris. And so uh, generally speaking, when you have animals that share uh, some scientific name parts, it means that they have characters that are similar to each other. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about these a, a little bit in a moment. Uh, the chorus frogs also, generally speaking, tend to be winter breeding species. Uh, there are a few examples of that that are, that are a little different, the little grass frog being the main one. They'll call through the summertime. Uh, by the way, that is an adult, a giant adult little grass frog. <laughs> they are very small, small species, smallest North American species. So we'll talk about, let's, let's go through uh, some of these in more detail. So the cricket frogs, uh, we have the northern cricket frog and the southern cricket frog. 
and the southern cricket frog is Acris grillus. So this is the southern cricket frog over here, and these are both northern cricket frogs over here on the right. There are some physical differences between those two species, but they can be somewhat challenging uh, to, to notice. One of the main ones that I noticed, but I've seen a lot of these, is that the southern cricket frog has a longer, narrower snout, uh, excuse me, longer, longer snout in general, and the uh, northern cricket frog has a shorter, more blunt snout. Um, so these, these northern cricket frogs look a little different to me than the southern. The colors of these animals uh, don't really help you at all. So, you know, don't write down, well, southern cricket frogs are always bright green with sort of red or orange spots on them. No, these guys can be quite variable. You can see colorations of cricket frogs of either species in any of these three, or I've seen them where they are mostly brown with a bright green stripe down the middle of the back, red stripe down the middle of the back, a little bit more red with a green stripe, almost like a Christmas frog, uh, a little bit almost yellowy kind of a stripe. So there is a lot of variation in this species. And you're gonna hear that word with a lot of frog species, variability. Uh, they don't always look like that beautiful field guide photograph that you might see. So generally, there are multiple characters that you may want to use to help you identify the species. With the cricket frogs, no matter what the coloration is, they'll pretty much always, and what's our line, Mike? You never say never and never say always, but pretty Absolutely. much always, <laughs> you're going to be able to see a triangle between the eyes. So you can see a triangle here on this frog. Sometimes people see it better as a Y that splits up to the eyes. Uh, this one, you can see that little triangle between the eyes. Now this one, I readily admit, it's difficult to see the triangle from this photograph. But if I had it in my hand, I'd be willing to bet that I could make out the triangle between the eyes there. They also do have fairly warty skin. So this is one of those groups of species that uh, if you find these away from water, you might think to yourself, oh man, this kind of looks toad-like. Uh, by how warty the skin is, but again, it's one that has frog as a common name, so that just goes to the, the confusion of frog versus toad. Uh, cricket frogs use a wide variety of wetlands for breeding. Uh, they're able to tolerate some levels of fish. Both species, uh, their tadpole has, uh, the very end of the tail is almost a jet black color, like you dipped the very tip of it into India ink. And that serves as a defense mechanism so that it looks like a giant eye spot. So if a fish was going to target that tadpole, it would hit the back of the tail instead of the head area. And so the tadpole will then regrow that part of the tail that, that gets bitten off. It's certainly a challenge for them, but it does allow them to survive and exist in some bodies of water that may or may not have fish present. Uh, there are many frog species that can't tolerate fish or can't, aren't able to breed in wetlands that have fish because fish are such uh, significant predators on both eggs and tadpoles, but cricket frogs are able to do that, again, because of that uh, tadpole uh, characteristic that helps them uh, stay protected. Uh, these guys will call at lots of different times of the year. Notice it says spring to summer. I've actually heard cricket frogs calling as early as January and February, and I've heard them calling almost all the way into you know, October, November kind of time period. So they do call at lots of times of the year, but that spring, summer, sort of April, May, June, July is really their peak period of activity. And that's generally speaking when you tend to see eggs and things like that. So let's listen to see how they, they uh, sound to one another. Oh, before I do that, notice that I've got the range maps here or the dot maps here for those species. And you'll notice that the northern cricket frog is in the Piedmont and western part of the state, whereas the southern cricket frog is in the coastal plain. There are a few places in sort of that uh, northwestern coastal plain area or eastern Piedmont region where you have both species potentially present. And that's where it gets the most complicated uh, between these two because they, they sound fairly similar. But many times, if you just look at where you are on planet Earth, <laughs> that can help you, you know, what county are you in? That can help you figure out which tree frog or which frog species you might have calling, no matter what it is. But it's especially helpful with the cricket frogs. Uh, you know, you know, if you're in 
Orange or Durham County, for instance, and you hear a cricket frog, it's a northern cricket frog because uh, southerns don't range uh, quite that far. So let's listen to Jeff, how they're uh, called. Jeff, yeah. uh, this might be a good time to bring this up. Uh, Mike asked this a while back and said, distribution map question. Seems to be a concentration on distribution maps around Wake County. Also appears to be a line, a parallel to coastal plain line, only shifted west compared to the line on the map. Sadly, there appears to be a lack of data uh, in the county of Alamance. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think a lot of that is done, but that's a fall line is a is a lot of times a good dividing line where you'd see, in this case, the northern and southern cricket frogs. Jeff, you want to say anything else about why it's that concentration? Yeah, a bunch of things. So, uh, yeah, that dividing line is usually very important for a lot of taxa groups, not just reptiles and amphibians, uh, but there's a lot of species that, you know, they are uh, present in the coastal plain uh, and not in the Piedmont or vice versa. And so, yes, you'll you'll see that in lots of range maps where that that default that fault line shows up really well and and really divides where species occur and where they don't occur. As far as the dots, so as I mentioned before, this is at least a representation of where the animals have been found, but doesn't represent exactly where they exist. Right? It it represents where people have looked the most, and. Uh, what is it we say, Mike? You know, there there tends to be a pretty interesting correlation between how many dots there are and the range of a major university that might be in the area. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, uh, yeah, the proximity to a a a, a graduate uh, a graduate student in a university, pretty much. Exactly. So so yeah, you're gonna and and places that have more people looking for things like Wake County, you're gonna see more more records in those kinds of areas. It doesn't always hold true, but but sometimes that's the case. And if you have a lot more people in an area, you may have the potential for more people to be looking at things. So yes, there's there's definitely some biases in these maps. I would not use these maps to suggest uh, anything about abundance. So this is not suggesting that northern cricket frogs are most abundant, you know, right in this part of the Piedmont, Wake County, Johnston County, Harnett County. There are plenty of them there. But that doesn't mean there's any less of them in Chatham County or Alamance, which doesn't even have a record here. You know, several of these other counties. This is not a representation of abundance in any shape, way or form. So that that is an important. It just happens that there are lots of records from here. That doesn't necessarily mean there are more of them. That means more people have looked for them there. Yeah. So that's a good point. Anything else, Mike? Uh, no, there's a few more, but we'll get to those uh, as we go along to some few more slides. Okay, let's listen to a couple species. Let's listen to the uh, southern cricket frog first. So this is, sounds a bit like uh, marbles clicking together or pebbles clicking together. And you'll hear some differences between these two species. Again, I'm, I've noted that they are similar. In the case of the southern cricket frog, the clicks uh, are right together. So you can't really hear each individual click. And in the northern cricket frog, you'll hear some separation between the clicks. So on the southern, it'll be kind of like a, but on the uh, northern, it'll be sort of more, more spread out, more. <laughs> so let's play those instead of Jeff's uh, imitation, <laughs> poor imitation. Uh, it helps if I click the thing. Uh, doggone it. There we go. You hear it, Mike? Nope, not picking it up. Let's try. It says I'm sharing my audio, but I'll try it again. How about got now? It, got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Now let's contrast that with the southern, excuse me, the northern cricket frog. There's almost a graininess to that call. Okay, let's listen to the Southern again. Interestingly, if you see a sonogram of these two species calls, it's pretty similar. 
The difference is that the Acris grillus, the southern cricket frog, is really compacted, all of those little clicks. So it really sounds like one click, 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 click. And then in the case of the northern cricket frog, it's spread out so that it sounds like click, 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 kind of a type deal. So anyway, all right, let's go on to another species. Spring peeper, this is one that probably many of you have, have heard and seen before. Uh, they are marked by the X on the back, uh, Sudacus crucifer, crucifer meaning cross. Almost always they're going to have that X on the back. Every once in a while I'll see one that has a fifth line on it that, that looks like some sort of weird medieval sword or something like that. But, uh, but generally speaking, they uh, almost always have that X. They're almost always sort of this peachy color, orangey peachy or, or a, a, a little bit of a brown coloration found pretty much throughout the state. Uh, there are probably counties on here that don't have them, but I would guess they're in every county in the state. This is a poorly named species. Uh, for North Carolina, this species often starts calling in December, uh, January, so it's really a winter peeper, not a spring peeper. In fact, most locations in the eastern and, and Piedmont part of the state, uh, this species has stopped calling. Uh, you might still hear it in the mountains up until maybe some parts of June at the highest mountain elevations, but most places uh, this guy is actually uh, quit calling uh, around the springtime, certainly by summertime. So anyway, winter peeper is probably more appropriate. They breed in lots of different little spots uh, and they are amazing in the term of uh, the volume that they produce from this tiny little, you know, one inch or inch and a quarter uh, sized frog, maybe inch and a half at, at, on the on the largest end. Uh, but this little peep sound that they make, if you're in a chorus of a lot of them, it can be almost deafening. So let's listen to what they sound like. Picking up some other species in the background there, but I won't confuse you yet with, with what any of those are. Uh, but uh, that one's probably one that, that most of you have least heard before. Interestingly, if you like science fiction movies and where they go to other planets and things like that, very often, if it's nighttime on another planet, on some other movie, you'll hear spring peepers calling. <laughs> it turns out they're extraterrestrial. Mm. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's part of Jeff Hall humor, right, Mike? Oh, boy. Um a couple of things, Jeff, I wanted to mention about peepers, and uh, and then there was a question about this. Um, we've done lots of these and doing other things, in this, and you would go to the same location where in January or February, you might hear hundreds, it sounds like thousands of these singing, and then you go to that same location in, in, in June, July, and August, you cannot find a single one of them. That's uh, They just disappear, and nobody knows you know, where they go or what happens. Yeah, there's a lot of species that we can find uh, fairly readily during their breeding season, but outside of breeding season, uh, when they're not in those wetlands, uh, they can be very difficult to find. Some frog species stay at their breeding ponds pretty much year round, most of the more aquatic frogs, but most of the ones in this group, the Hylidae, uh, do not stay near their pond. They stay you know, somewhere up in the woods or in leaf litter or in the bark of the tree or holes in trees, things like that. So yeah, if you told me, you know, hey, Jeff, I'd give you $100,000 if you find a spring peeper in July. Well, I'd do my darndest and maybe I'd turn one up somewhere. But they're actually pretty, pretty difficult to find outside of that breeding season, even though it's an extremely common species. And you can find them in choruses, you know, hundreds of frogs at a single wetland at the right time of year. But, yeah, it's interesting how uh, frogs like this can disappear outside of breeding season. And uh, Jeff, a uh, couple more questions. Has been noted... Uh... Um, has it been noted that our climate, as our climate warms, they call earlier? Uh, that's not really been seen a whole lot here. Uh, you know, it, it could be something that we we find uh, going further. You know, we find more information about it. You know, temperature change thus far is pretty minimal. But what we do see a big difference is in swings of climate. So periods of drought or periods of flood. 
uh, we do have that more in seemingly more intensive droughts and more intensive uh, flood years. And so that certainly impacts breeding of amphibians. And so sometimes we've had some weird droughts in the winter that we would not normally have. And then we may have floods in the winter in the summer. By floods, I just mean heavy rains. And that can throw off uh, the schedule for a lot of species. So we do see some impacts uh, to, to climate change uh, from the species, but not necessarily uh, earlier calling or, or things of that nature, because I think there's still a pretty uh, fine window of, of time uh, when you have to have that warming period before they start calling. And one last question that Colleen uh, asked, do all the Sudacris have triangles between the eyes like the acris? No, they do not. Sorry. Uh, good question. You can actually see there's a little bit of one here on the spring peeper that is highly, highly variable. I've seen tons of peepers that don't have that little triangle there, but sometimes they will have a little bit of it. But but generally speaking, the sedacris do not have that. Um, many of the sedacris do have a pattern that's similar to this animal. So they'll have, uh, and again, just to use common terms, chorus frogs, generally many of them have this uh, chocolatey stripe through the eye with, uh, a cream stripe underneath it, and then three stripes down the middle of the back. Uh, between the upland chorus frog, the southern chorus frog, uh, the Brimley's chorus frog, and the little grass frog, all four of those species share this sort of uh, general characteristic. Uh, the Brimley's chorus frog has the most complete stripes on the back. Then the next most complete is the upland chorus frog, the one we're looking at here or occasionally you may have a dash in the line, you know, it's not complete. And then the Southern chorus frog is the one that's actually the least complete line. So sometimes they may just be a couple of dashes here and there, or even lines that look like they're, they're mostly gone. Um, the little grass frog looks a lot like the upland chorus frog in terms of its pattern. So similar, you can kind of make out those lines, but it's much smaller and uh, has some other different features about it. But again, all those do have this general shape and, and feature that, that they, they share with one another. Uh, they are uh, several of them found in different parts of the state. Generally speaking, your uh, frog diversity is highest in the coastal plain. And so Brimley's chorus frog and Southern chorus frog are mainly in the coastal plain. Upland chorus frog replacing those two species into the Piedmont and Western part of the state. Little grass frog is mostly coastal, but does get into the Piedmont just a little bit. Um, these guys, uh, again, mostly winter breeding uh, species and all of these chorus frogs, except for maybe a couple of them, we think of as in this comb group. And I actually have a comb. Uh, so this is uh, from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. They gave me this comb. And uh, it's if you if you pull the tines of the comb. Sounds a little bit. Uh, maybe I need to go the other direction. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a cricket frog, a chorus frog, rather, excuse me. Or we can do the lower one. So anyway, comb frogs, some of them call faster, some of them call slower. You can see this says creak on it, so let's listen to it. Nice big chorus there now. This is a species that did undergo some changes in the common names. So some of you may have seen it listed as Southeastern Chorus Frog at one time. They changed it back to Upland Chorus Frog because that was too confusing with Southern Chorus Frog, which I kind of agree. But anyway, um, the Southern Chorus Frog uh, sounds very similar. It's called, but it's a little bit slower. Uh, Mike, you have a way to remember that? Uh, yeah, I'm from the South and I talk slow, so Southern to me is slow. <laughs> exactly. So Southern Chorus Frog is a little bit slower. Brimley's Chorus Frog does this as well, but it's much, much faster. And All Jeff, right. this may be a good time to bring up with the Chorus Frogs about sounding different with different temperatures, because those three can be really hard uh, to, to, to tell the difference because they can vary a little bit 
based on temperature. Yeah, that's a good point, and that actually works for all frog species. Uh, the The pitch and the frequency with which they're calling changes just a little bit uh, based on temperature. So frogs call a little bit faster in warmer temperatures, and they may call at slightly higher pitches in warmer temperatures than at colder temperatures. And it has to do with the mechanics of uh, the way that they call uh, moving air across their vocal cords, which goes then into their uh, uh, vocal sac, which uh, makes that sound expand. And so that sound can change a little bit based on the temperature. So yeah, good point, Grant, uh, Mike. <laughs> uh, so uh, another uh, Sudacris, the one in the court, another chorus frog here, the little grass frog, we mentioned him already. Uh, you can see that chocolate stripe through the eye. He's got three stripes down the back. Can't see them terribly well in this photograph, but but they're in there. Uh, this one, mostly coastal plain, does get a little bit in the Piedmont. I can't remember if there actually have been some Wake County records, but I believe that there have been. Uh, this guy calls almost all year long, uh, really most heavily calls in the summertime, June, July. This is one that's really difficult to detect if you're far away. It's very insect-like, so let's, let's let you listen. Very easy to miss this call thinking it's something else. Uh, in fact, we have had folks in our workshops that cannot hear the species because it's out of their auditory range. And so if you didn't hear anything just now, <laughs> so, sorry, you might be in that category. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's a really, really insect like high pitched uh, sound. Uh, Mike, any other questions about the chorus frogs? If not, I'll move on to the other group. Well, Colleen asked this earlier, and I didn't catch it in time, but uh, now that you're on tree frogs, it, it says, why does the presentation say tree frog at the top when you're talking about course frogs? This is one of those initial slides you, you went into yep. with that. Yep, yep, great question. So this whole group, Hylidae, is, really, is referred to as the tree frogs. But when you get down into the different genera that are in there, Acris, Sudacris, and Hyla, I wasn't going to go into that too much, but then you get into a little bit more specifics. Why they're all called tree frogs, why this whole group Hylidae is referred to as tree frogs, is that they all share a character that is most easily seen on the Hyla species tree frogs, the ones here that we think of as the, as the, as the real tree frogs in the group. And they all have this expanded digit on the end of their toe, basically a toe pad. Um, if you think of E.T. sticking his finger out and you can see that big disc on the end of his finger, uh, E.T. indeed was a tree frog. You might not have known that. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the species in Hylidae have those toe pads. It's just that the tree frogs and the chorus frogs, that pad is so reduced that you really have to look carefully to notice it. They still have that little uh, cup on the very tip of their toes. It's just nowhere near uh, what you might see, like you can see this Pine Barrens tree frog. You can see these very obvious uh, pads out on the ends of each of its toes, and you can see it pretty well on these other guys as well. So the tree frogs, all those in the genus Hyla, again, part of the family Hylidae, all have really well-developed suction cups at the tips of their toes. The others in this family have them. They're just really, really significantly reduced. All right, so let's keep moving through uh, this, this group. So these are the ones in that, that genus Hyla. So again, we're still in that same family, but these are the ones you can see those suction cups a little bit better on, and it makes them all really good at climbing. So the cricket frogs and chorus frogs really are not good at climbing because those little pads are not, not as developed or, or they're more uh, uh, shrunken uh, than, than are the, the rest of the group. Um, but these guys are all very, very good climbers. So we have two species in the gray tree frog group. We have the Cope's gray tree frog, which is Hyla chrysocelis, and the gray tree frog, Hyla versicolor, sometimes called common gray tree frog, sometimes called northern gray tree frog. Uh, 
it, I try to not use the term common gray tree frog in North Carolina because it gives the misconception of this species being common. Common in a common name is generally saying that the animal has a very big distribution, which is the case of Hyla versicolor. But if you look at the red on this map, that is uh, represents two or three dots of Hyla versicolor in the state. There are actually a couple of other records in Davie County and Iredell County and in Mecklenburg County. But generally speaking, uh, there's this weird sort of Piedmont Crescent distribution for Hyla versicolor. But mostly throughout the state, the, the species that you see most is the Cope's gray tree frog. It's the one that's much more common. So now that I've confused you again, uh, these two species look identical. Uh, you cannot distinguish them just by visual, um, but you would have to uh, either do genetic work uh, because uh, the common versicolor has twice as many chromosomes as the other one, or you can tell the difference between their calls. Their calls are a little bit different. Now, if you have one in your hand, how would you be able to tell that it's this group, Hyla chrysoselis or Hyla versicolor? Um, what you're gonna see is uh, a white patch under the eye. That's one thing that is a nice distinguishing character. Notice this frog is not always uh, gray colored. Uh, this one's actually almost more of a brown maybe. This one is a nice gray color. This one is actually a dark green. And this one is a funky kind of marbledy green color. This one is, it's really a rare or uncommon to see an adult that's green like that, but it does happen. Uh, it's more common to see juveniles, fresh metamorphs like this one here that are greenish in color, even though they are actually gray tree frogs. So that white patch under the eye can help. If it's an older frog, uh, an adult, like this guy will not have these colors, but for most tree or all tree frog species, you can actually help identify them by the concealed surfaces uh, in their flanks here. So on the gray tree frog, you'll have an orange wash with yellow spots on top of it. But that's gonna be different for every other frog species. Even though there may be other tree frogs that are colored gray, uh, if we're looking for the gray tree frog, that specific pattern color in those concealed surfaces of the leg help us distinguish it from any of the others. There have been a lot of questions about what is that used for? Um, it's it's kind of there's kind of two theories about that. One is that people suppose that it is a flash color, so that they when they hop, that color shows up and it uh, scares a predator, and maybe gives just a moment for that frog to escape. But another less well developed um, understanding is that it may also have some communication uh, factors. So in Costa Rica. I've seen different species of tree frogs with lots of uh, very uh, highly colored uh, concealed surfaces actually sort of wave their leg. And I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, you probably can't, but anyway, sort of wave their leg out in the air. And as they do that, the moonlight will, will uh, sort of shine off of those colors. And there's some sort of communication going on there. And it's really not been well developed or or very well understood exactly what's going on and how that works. But it's certainly a possibility that our North American tree frogs also have that capacity and also do that to some degree, but I'm not aware of anyone that's really gone down that road to try to study it with any detail. Mike, any, any questions popping up? And then I'll, if not, I'll play some, some calls of these guys. Uh, no, there's some questions, but we can answer those at the break or the end. And, and, okay, so okay. yeah, go ahead and play the songs, yeah. Okay, so let's listen to the, this is the one that you're going to hear most often across the state. This is the Cope's gray tree frog. It's going to be a little bit harsher. Big old chorus there. By the way, intermittently, you're also hearing uh, a warning call that they do. Uh, many species have this. And in this case, it was sort of a ur, ur, ur. that's when two males are getting too close together and one male is telling the other one to back off. This is my little spot around this pond and you go ahead and move to a different place. Uh, very, lots of uh, frogs have that little uh, call that they make sort of warning another male to, to back off, sort of a territorial call aggression call, you might call it. 
Hyla versicolor, more bird-like, more melodic. <laughs> Okay, and I'm gonna play verse uh, chrysostos one more time. A lot faster, harsher, true. There's that little aggression call. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll get out of these guys, uh, but one last thing I'll mention is uh, if any of you live sort of in this uh, Piedmont Crescent-y kind of area, <clears throat> be look out for listening for your for tree frogs. We'd love to get more records for Hyla versicolor and understand its distribution a little better in the state. Pinewoods tree frog is a species that's mostly coastal, but notice that it's gray in coloration, so it looks a little bit like a gray tree frog uh, visually. It does not have that white spot under the eye. And we've got different colors in the concealed flanks now. So we have a purple with sort of a gold on top of that. Notice the difference here. So this is back to the gray tree frog, uh, sort of orange with yellow spots. Now we've got purple with yellow spots. So, so definitely quite different in the concealed flanks here. Uh, these guys, their call is, is much more, um, uh, I don't know, most maybe the most distinct frog call of just about any of them really does sound a lot like a Morse code machine. Uh, as their name suggests, principally found in uh, pine woods habitat, pine forest, flatwoods, things like that, uh, and uh, generally doesn't really like mixed pine, hardwood type forest too much. Mostly, mostly pine forest is where you're going to find this guy. Okay, and with uh, most of these, for example, generally speaking, are not particularly fish tolerant. Uh, they'll sometimes breed in ponds that have some levels of fish, but most of them prefer bodies of water that don't have fish in them, and they, they are much more productive in ponds that don't have fish in them. Uh, most of these tree frogs have about the same sort of breeding season, uh, sort of March, uh, April, May as peak breeding, uh, but notice like this animal will even call through October. This is also a species that calls often in the daytime. Many frogs um, don't call so much in the daytime, but there are a few that call uh, somewhat routinely, especially on an overcast uh, type of day, maybe a rainy day. Pinewoods tree frogs are in that group. Uh, green frogs, which we'll get to a little later, are also in that group. Any questions on those, Mike, that I yep, need good. to get to or keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So some of the greenish colored frogs. So here's a green tree frog, uh, and it has, um, uh, concealed surfaces here, we've got sort of a blue purple color. Uh, there's a white stripe that goes down the side of the body that is sometimes goes all the way down, sometimes like three quarters like this one, and sometimes that stripe is completely absent. Occasionally, there are little yellow uh, or, or golden dots on the back here, but sometimes those are absent as well. So there's a good bit of variation. This species is almost always green, but Sometimes in the winter, if you happen to see one, it may be almost a brown or almost a black color. Uh, but generally, uh, during the, the breeding time of the year, warmer temperatures of the year, it's going to be a nice bright green color. And it's one that if you caught it as a nice bright green color, it would, generally speaking, stay that same bright green color. That is not the case with the pine woods tree frog. I didn't mention this, but uh, these guys change color uh, based on a variety of, of metrics, but they can be green, like the color of this leaf here, or they can be this sort of brown or gray color, as you see in these two animals. Uh, but that that can change based on temperature and uh, other factors. And so I've seen them that, that this frog was all green, except for this little purple stripe through the eye. 
And then I caught it and held it to, for photographs the next day. And it looked like this the next day. And I was like, well, dang, I want to go on with the green one. So uh, they can definitely change color over time uh, based on uh, a variety of factors. Like I say, principally probably temperature, but there may be some other things uh, at play as well. So the coloration is not always um, uh, the help, most helpful thing. So green tree frog, uh, it is found in a much broader part of the state than what you see on this map. This is one of those species like Mike was referring to earlier that's actually expanded its range westward. And it's actually found all the way across this part of the Piedmont into as far west as Forsyth County and all the way down into uh, Mecklenburg County. Uh, so you can imagine all of these counties having dots and filled in. Um, so but this is a species that really has uh, expanded uh, quite a bit. Um, it tolerates fish to some degree, uh, but it has a little bit bigger, uh, uh, bulkier tadpoles than some of the other species. They're a little better at ev evading fish, so it's probably the most fish tolerant of the tree frog group, but uh, still, uh, you know, it, it does better in, in uh, ponds that don't have fish. That's a big chorus there. Uh, by the way, in that particular uh, recording, when you heard that sped up thing, so they're normally going quank, 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 but when you heard that quank, 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 that's again uh, uh, aggression type call. That's two males that are that are uh, getting close to one another, and one male's letting the other one know he's not happy about it. <laughs> All right. Another green colored tree frog, at least sometimes, is the squirrel tree frog. Uh, so this one's nice and green here, but notice this one over here is more sort of a gray brown color. It's got some patches of green on it, and I've seen them where they're all gray or almost all brown. But again, those concealed surfaces of the legs uh, being really, really helpful in identifying these different tree frogs. So this one has this uh, yellow or orangey wash without any spots on it or anything like that. Uh, so that's a, a key piece for the squirrel tree frog. Um, it, like the green tree frog, has also expanded into those same sorts of counties. So you can think of sort of Forsyth down through um, Mecklenburg. Sorry, I was a little farther west, but through this area, you're going to have uh, squirrel tree frogs expanded uh, as well. A uh, little bit smaller than the green tree frog. They don't ever have that white stripe that goes down the side and they're usually not quite as bold a green color as you might get on the green tree frog. But you can see how folks might confuse those uh, two species with one another. They use a lot of the same types of habitats, although squirrel tree frogs, I think, are even more tolerant of a variety of habitats than our green tree frogs. They'll use little ditches and things like that. Uh, some of you may have heard earlier I was saying you squirrel tree frogs calling just outside his uh, house a, a little earlier today. Um, so uh, they're, uh, they're a funny, funny critter. So they have two different kinds of calls. And this is the one that they make that uh, a lot of species have what we call a rain call. And that's a call that they make away from a wetland body, but they may make it because it's raining or overcast or something like that. And this one is uh, the reason that it's called the squirrel tree frog. Sounds like squirrels are back on my feet, or Mike, I got to go chase them off again. <laughs> but when they move to the water, uh, their call is quite different. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the green tree frog, but it's uh, lower in pitch uh, and less nasal more duck-like to me.
And that's a nice big chorus. Okay, our final uh, frog in the Hylidae family that we're going to talk about today is the barking tree frog. It's the largest one in the group, and uh, it is a really beautiful animal. Uh, you can see this one here is probably close to maybe two and a half, almost three inches long. Um, they are generally speaking this sort of coloration, although sometimes these uh, purpley kind of uh, pigments may be more reduced. They may be more green looking or occasionally I've seen one where it's almost like it's completely reversed. So everywhere that you see sort of this darker black pigment purpley stuff was green and all the green was actually more sort of this purpley color. So again, almost the inverse of what you see here. Uh, this one is a male. Uh, we can tell that because of all this extra throat material that's down here. You can do that, uh, identify males and females with all of the this whole group that we've looked at. If you have it in your hand, if you can look on the underside of its um, chin, it'll have extra throat material if it's a male. And generally speaking, it's a very different color than the belly of the animal is, whereas the female won't have that extra skin and her chin will be the same color as her belly. In this species, it's sort of a, got some yellow and orange kind of colors in there. Um, some species may have black color of that fold of skin, so that varies a good bit, but that can help you between males and females. Uh, these guys have started calling now, and, uh, you know, when there's only one calling, they don't really sound like a dog to me. It's more like when you get a bunch of them calling that they end up sounding like a pack of dogs. And part of the reason is this species does something a little different from what most frogs do, is that they choose a different pitch when they're calling to one another. So a lot of times you may have a frog that starts at a pitch and other frogs join that pitch and they all try to be really loud. And if you're not musically inclined, I apologize, but I'll explain. So in this case, these guys, when they start calling, each frog chooses a different pitch. So maybe one's going, dunk, 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 then another one's gonna go, dunk, dunk, dunk. So when they call together, it sounds like, dunk, 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 dunk. And if you get a whole bunch of them together, it's going to be don't do don't do don't 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 don't. So let me let you hear what that sounds like in non Jeffies. So that's two frogs. And we got a bunch more. Now we got a whole bunch. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of an interesting species that way okay any questions on the tree frogs mike no just um getting some real cool mnemonics from folks about what they think it sounds like so uh, <laughs> yeah it's kind of neat imagine. okay okay so we're going to do a little quick test so go ahead and uh write somewhere on a little piece of paper five you know one through five and uh, we're going to see how well you do in this. What we'll do is I'll play a call uh, that you can see here. You won't have a picture or anything like that, because when you're at a pond, you know, you don't see the critter. I'll play the sound. Then I'll show you a picture of the frog and I'll play the sound. And then I'll show you the name. So you'll be, uh, you know, self uh, self testing here. So uh, let's see how this goes. All right. for us now. All right, so now let's see the frog. Squirrel tree frog. How do we do? Everybody's batting 100, maybe? <laughs> maybe not. All right, number two.
The other thing that you would normally know that I have not given you in this is you would know the time of year that you're listening and you would know where you are. So I'll give you that information. I'll say it's March 15th and you are in uh, Wake County. So you got that sort of that marbles clicking together. Visually, you can see there's that triangle between the eyes. And uh, based on the location, you would know it had to be northern rather than southern cricket frog. But also it has sort of a shorter, blunter snout visually, sort of toad-like appearance, sort of warty body. All right, number three. You're in Alamance County and it's uh, early March. Everybody doing okay? Everybody shaking their fist at me? <laughs> Next. You could be anywhere in the state. And let's say it's uh, May the 1st. All right, how are we doing? How do we do? Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> the last one. All right, let's say you are in, um, oh, let's, uh, well, <laughs> we'll say you're in Alamance County and it's uh, June 1st. All right, that's the last one. How'd everybody do? Did you get uh, 100%? Yeah. Mike, how'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen anybody respond about how they did, but that's okay. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, we'll move into the ranted frogs. So uh, in the Ranidae family, we have uh, nine species represented. This is the newest one, the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog right here in the middle. Uh, and over on the far right corner, you actually see a picture of him uh, from Ed Corey. Uh, nice, nice picture of one. Uh, this species is, uh, again, newly described only within the last five years, so we're not going to focus a lot on it today. It does look a lot like the southern leopard frog, except that it doesn't really have a spot in the middle of the tympanum. There are some other characters, too, but again, not going to go into it too much today. Uh, all of these guys, uh, not all, most of these guys tend to stay around the wetlands uh, almost year-round. Uh, but there are some exceptions. Gopher frogs, wood frogs, uh, and southern leopard frogs all may move away from those wetlands for certain periods of time. In the case of the gopher frog, it may be a really long period of time. And wood frogs also make fairly large overland um, uh, excursions where they may not be near water for much of the year. So there is some, some variability and how long these uh, these guys uh, hang out right at their wetland. So let's look at a couple of them. So the bullfrog uh, found statewide, 
there probably are some counties uh, missing a dot, although, oh yeah, famous Alamance County uh, missing one there. Uh, looks like that might be Cleveland County, could be, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm stretching myself in this corner of the state where I know my county is a little less well. Somebody can correct me, but I think that might be, or it could be Polk, although I think Polk is a little further away. Anyway, uh, mostly found throughout the state, probably in those counties even that don't have a record currently. Uh, these guys get to be our largest one. Um, you can see this big one here. Um, so, so yeah, these are uh, really, really uh, big, big species. They have the deepest kind of call. It is true that there is some correlation between the size of the frog and the uh, pitch of their call. Larger frogs tending to have lower pitched sounds, smaller frogs tending to have higher pitched songs. And so it makes uh, total sense that the bullfrog would have the lowest pitched call, it's the largest frog. Little grass frog has the highest pitch call and it's the uh, smallest. So uh, there, that is a definitely a correlation. Basically, you know, the, the size of the re resonator in terms of musical terms of where that uh, sound originates from. Let's listen to bullfrog. <laughs> Uh, one more character that you can use to identify this species if you have it in hand, because it can look a little bit similar to some other really aquatic species, like the green frog, which we'll see in just a moment, is look at this fold of skin here. Uh, as it travels back from the eye, it curves down around the tympanum or the tympanic membrane or the eardrum that's uh, visible on many frogs. Not absolutely everyone, but most frog species, you can you can find a tympanum somewhere. And on the bullfrog, that fold of skin curves right down and around it. You can see that on this animal as well. On the green frog, that fold of skin actually travels all the way down the length of the body, and we call that a dorsolateral fold. Uh, so the dorsolateral fold is visible on the green frog, but is not on the, the uh, bullfrog, or rather it really, it, it folds down around beside the tympanum. Another interesting thing about these two species, the bullfrog and the green frog, and then I'll, I'll get to you, Mike, sounds like you might have a, a question, uh, is that in these two species and these two alone for North Carolina, you can identify males and females by looking at the ratio of the size of the tympanum to the eye of the frog. So if the tympanum is larger, than the eye or, or significantly larger than the eye, it is a male. So this is a male here. If the tympanum is about the same size as the eye or maybe only just slightly, you know, slightly larger or right about the same size, it is a female. So this one is a female. This tympanum is about the same size as that eye. Now this is a little bit of an angled shot. So you, you can't see it quite as well, but you just have to trust me. This one's a female and this one's a male. So when you look at this green frog, this one is very obvious that this one is a male. That, that's a giant tympanum on that particular uh, particular male. It's not always quite that um, uh, pronounced, but uh, yes, that does work. Again, only on green frog and bullfrog does that work. It doesn't work for any other species in our state, um, but, but that is another character to identify males from females. Uh, green frogs are a little smaller than bullfrogs, but if you have one, that is a juvenile bullfrog, it may be the same size as a green frog. And so they can look really, really similar to one another. They both have statewide distributions as you see the green frog map below us, uh, but their calls are quite different. They do call about the same time of year, starting about now or last month uh, through most of the summer. Uh, both green frogs and bullfrogs, generally speaking, like permanent water bodies. Uh, why is that? Well, they both have tadpole stages that are much longer than any of the species we've seen thus far. All of the group uh, in the Hylidae, uh, they all uh, have relatively short uh, larval stages, tadpoles. They're usually tadpoles for maybe three, four months, something in that uh, ballpark. And so they are able to utilize bodies of water that may periodically dry up. In fact, they may seek those out because those tend to not have fish living in them. Uh, but these groups, uh, the ranid frogs, many of them are tolerant of fish. 
and uh, thus they, they have these longer larval periods. Their tadpoles uh, are much larger than most of the uh, other species we've been talking about. They have much more well-developed musculature in their tail, allow them to avoid fish, and the final sort of thing that helps them is that most of these are distasteful to fish. And so they will, generally speaking, avoid a lot of the ranted tadpoles that may be in a pond uh, where there are also big predators like largemouth bass or bluegill or things like that. They don't tend to eat ranted tadpoles uh, quite as much as they would uh, any other type of tadpole or other food type. Now, call-wise, the green frog's quite different. Uh, sort of a loose banjo string is a good description. Green frogs do often call during the daytime as well, so it's, it's not uncommon to hear one, just a couple of plunks like that if you're walking through a swamp or, or something like that, uh, you know, in, in, in the daytime, you, you could potentially hear that. Let's look at them side by side. So we've got green frog and bullfrog here together. This is the green frog on the left. Uh, you can see visually they just kind of look a little similar, but notice that dorsolateral fold down the length of the body here and curves down behind the tympanum on the bullfrog. Now, sometimes you will see pigment that looks like it goes down behind the, the, the uh, tympanum on the green frog. And sometimes you'll have a little bit of a pigmented stripe on a bullfrog. So you have to look, you know, is it is it actually a fold of skin or is it pigment you're looking at? But uh, that can be a good identifying, a couple of good identifying characters between those two. Mike, questions on the green frog and bullfrog? Yeah, um, Heather asked, are bullfrogs native to North Carolina? And yes, they are, but where they've been introduced out west, they're causing all kinds of issues. You want to touch on that, Jeff? Yeah, so all the species we're talking about today are all native to North Carolina, and uh, they're, they're supposed to be in our water bodies, and they don't cause problems. They're, that's, you know, part of what they do. Uh, bullfrogs are predators on lots of different species, but again, they are native, and they're they're supposed to be here, so that's that's part of the way it works. Um, in the western part of the United States, uh, they have been introduced because they're a good they're a good uh, specimen to use in classroom studies, looking at tadpoles and raising them up, and etc. And so, as a result of that, there have been a lot of classrooms that order these tadpoles, raise them up, and then when they get to be uh, juveniles, they don't want to kill them, so they release them into ponds near the school or something like that. And as a result, we have widespread introduction of bullfrogs across much of the Southwest and California and a number of places. Because they're not normally found there, uh, they're gobbling up literally a lot of other frog species. And so they are a real problem in, in places where they're not native. But again, I'll stress they are native here and they're not a, a problem animal um, where they're native in North Carolina. Anything else, Mike? Oh, sorry about that. Nope, uh, we're good. We're good. All right, let's keep trucking. Another two species in this family that look similar to one another are the southern leopard frog and the pickerel frog. Now, in the case of the southern leopard frog, the spotting looks more like you uh, flick a paintbrush and the paint falls wherever it happens to fall. They tend to be a little bit more rounded, the spots on this animal. And the stripes that are on the side tend to be a little bit more bold than what you might see on the pickerel frog. They're, they're often sort of a yellow or gold color. And finally, there is a nice uh, cream or white spot that is almost always <laughs> in the tympanum of this frog. Mike and I have actually seen a few southern leopard frogs that did not have that spot. But generally speaking, uh, they're going to have that, that spot in the middle of the tympanum. Now compare it with the pickerel frog, uh, the spotting pattern, these spots are a little bit more squared. They're a little bit more paired with one another, so they look like they were placed. They're not quite as haphazard and random as what we see on the southern leopard frog. Uh, no spot in the tympanum, and although there are folds of skin down the side, to me they're not quite as bold as what we see on the southern leopard frog. 
Distributionally, the pickerel frog is found throughout the state, including the mountain region, uh, whereas the southern leopard frog does not make it into the mountain region. So if you're in the mountains, that's the only species you're going to have is the pickerel frog. The rest of the state, you could have either or. So what are some other ways to distinguish them? Well, certainly their call and uh, the timing of their breeding. In the case of the leopard frog, it may actually breed almost any time of the year that there's appropriate temperatures and rainfall. So it's not uncommon to have a pond that leopard frogs are using that may actually have multiple stages of tadpoles. So maybe they bred in January and they also bred in May and they also bred in September. So you might have three different size groups of tadpoles in that same pond because they just are able to do that. The pickerel frog on the other hand is only really a winter breeder, February and March, or it's or early spring maybe, uh, or it's that's its peak activity time. Uh, up into the mountain counties, you definitely are going to get it into uh, into April uh, and maybe even early May in some years. So uh, yeah, you can have it uh, a little bit later than that in these uh, higher elevation type sites. They do separate themselves out a little bit by habitat as well. Uh, leopard frogs tend to use waters that aren't really moving as much, tend to be still more like ponds, um, swamps, um, slow moving sloughs, things like that. Whereas pickerel frogs are gonna be more using uh, flowing bodies of water. So rivers, creeks, streams, things of that nature. That doesn't mean you won't have overlap of habitat between the two. I've seen pickerel frogs in ponds and I've seen leopard frogs in streams and creeks. Just generally speaking, they do separate out a little bit that way. Their calls are quite different, which helps. So let's listen to the leopard frog. You're going to hear some chuckling and some croaking and sort of a uh, balloon rubbing kind of sound. Sort of a burp is like the way I think of it. big chorus there. Okay, so now let's contrast that with the pickerel frog. And I like to say some of you may recognize uh, uh, a relative in this one. Notice you could tell that one was calling in the wintertime. You had a little, you had a spring peeper calling in there as well. Some of you are probably starting to pick up on those other species that are in there. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, there are a lot of species of frogs that will call underwater, some more often than others. And when they do that call underwater, it's very difficult for us to hear it. Uh, it does cause vibrations in the water that the females can hear if they're sitting in the water. But as an observer, uh, I've actually seen pickerel frogs in the pond that's right behind the visitor center at uh, Haw River State Park. And I've seen a male in there. Uh, he was probably two, three feet under the water and I could just see his uh, vocal sacs distending. They have dual vocal sacs on the sides as do several of the ranids. Um, and uh, I could see his, his vocal sacs going out like that, but I couldn't hear anything. So it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, I just happened to spot him with my flashlight when I was looking around the pond. He was just under the water there. So uh, that does happen with some species also. So you put those two together. Again, you can see how sort of similar they are, at least superficially. you got a spot in the tympanum here, some, a stripe that's maybe a little more bold and a little bit less obvious spotting or a little bit less um, uh, paired spotting, a little more haphazard. So this is the leopard frog here and the pickerel frog on this side. You also will get some differences in the color and sort of the, the flanks and sides of these animals. You often get a yellow or orange uh, that you see here on the pickerel frog. And on a leopard frog, you'll often get kind of a green or blue color uh, that you can see some hints of that green here and just a little bit tucked in here. So uh, you'll, you'll get those differences between those as well. Questions on those two species, Mike? 
Uh, no, no, we're good. We're good. All right. Uh, our last uh, species from the Randa group that I'll spend a little bit of time on is a species that I spend a lot of uh, work time on, and that is the gopher frog. This is a species that you'll notice I had to zoom the map in for you because it's otherwise hard to tell uh, how many places this thing is found. And actually, this is a historical map, so it includes a lot of places that they no longer occur, sadly. So if I showed you where, where they were now, it'd just be a couple of dots here, a couple of dots here, and a few dots up through here. So all these, these dots through here uh, basically are, are no longer um, uh, being, no longer does that frog occur there. Uh, it is a, a decent sized frog, sort of toad-like in appearance. Uh, I think they're quite handsome, but you know, everybody's beauty in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting species. So they, they spend probably a month at the most, maybe two months in the pond where they breed, but the rest of the year, so the rest of the, you know, 10 months of the year, they actually live up in longleaf pine uplands. Uh, they live in stump holes or burrows made by other animals. And uh, they can be long distances away from the, the ponds that they breed in. Uh, we've had them averaging, you know, over a mile away from those ponds. And one individual frog that we had transmitter on to, to tell where they were going actually traveled 2.1 miles away from the wetland that he bred in. And he did that two years in a row to the exact same stump hole. So these frogs really have a, a capacity to travel significant distances on the landscape. That's one of the reasons that they're imperiled because of, of that distance traveled. Uh, this is not one you're probably gonna get the chance to hear, but I do wanna play it for you because it's a really neat uh, sounding snore call, not too different from the pickerel frog, but a little bit so. So I'll play that for you. I've never heard a chorus of gopher frogs quite like that. So just real quickly, a little side tangent, some things that we're trying to do to help this species uh, is actually try to head start these animals. And so in 2011, we marked a whole bunch of frogs at a particular site where we uh, collected eggs, raised them up, and then released them back into the wetland. And two years later, I caught this frog and uh, I was doing some egg mass surveys at the pond. And uh, I was photographing it. And then right before I released it, I thought, oh, I should check it to see if it's marked. So in the, the, all the metamorphs that we released in that 2011 group, we actually injected visible implant elastomer, VIE. And it's a, basically a little uh, plastic that is wet when you inject it. And then it hardens to a, a fairly soft plastic still, but we injected it two places in these frogs, in the foot where you can see that's the same mark, and then a second uh, mark uh, up, up the leg just a little bit. And so those were uh, v uh, visible in this frog. And so that was really nice, a, a nice success. And so a, a, a year or two later, we decided that we really should do this more because it's, it's obviously at least effective a little bit. Um, and so now we have this jump starting process uh, you know, frogs jump, head starting, that just seemed too boring, right? So jump starting. So we go to wetlands like this that have frogs, uh, gopher frogs historically breeding in them. We look for their egg masses, which are these uh, beautiful uh, blue uh, egg mass things. Uh, we collect samples from each egg mass, uh, not the whole thing, just a small portion of the mass that we raise in captivity. And once they hatch out, we actually move them then to outdoor tanks and we raise them up to metamorphosis, and then we release them back into the sites of capture. And so this is a pretty neat process, and we've been marking frogs now uh, for the last five or six years of this process, and we've released now uh, over 3,200 metamorphs into a variety of wetlands. Uh, I should say this work could not happen without partnerships with the North Carolina Zoo and the North Carolina Aquariums, especially Fort Fisher Aquarium, uh, where uh, those folks have done uh, outstanding work to help raise these uh, frogs and put them back into the wild. Okay, any questions yeah, about- Just a second. I know, I know we're pushed for time, but uh, there's a couple of 
prevalent questions in here. Uh, is uh, Stacy asked, is the places where they're found now all preserved areas such as the Croatan? I know of at least one breeding site that's on private property. Um, yeah, the, the full answer is no, they're not all on conserved property. Um, they are, there are some uh, breeding sites that are on private lands. Uh, in some cases, those private landowners are um, uh, uh, amenable to uh, gopher frogs being there. And in fact, uh, uh, one or two private landowners are excited that they have gopher frogs breeding in their ponds and they uh, give us full access to their land, and we've actually head started animals from their ponds and things like that. We also know of other populations that exist on private land that we do not have permission to survey for, uh, even though we've actually asked a number of times. And so uh, some places uh, we know they exist, but we don't know how they're doing because we're, we're not, we have not been given access to those lands. So they are not found uh, exclusively on quote unquote protected lands, but they are found on um, the vast majority of the sites where they are, are definitely in uh, public uh, uh, conservation ownership, but there are some sites that they are, are found that, that are not. Okay, um, folks, y'all have got some great questions, but uh, Jeff and I are really conscious on this two hour timeline and we've got a few more species to go. Uh, at the end, we'll be glad to answer these, but uh, we want to get through all the species uh, uh, in yeah. that two o'clock time frame. So yeah, great and we questions just, and we'll get back to you. Okay, Jeff. And we just have three families left and they're the small family. So uh, we'll, we should be able to get through and still have plenty of time for questions. So I'll, 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 I'll go into a little bit faster mode. So the true toads, the Bufana day, uh, this includes all those ones that, again, that, that third grade answer of what a toad looks like or what's a toad. This is the answer that you give them even though there are some that we'll see just after this that, that uh, we might call toad, but don't look quite so rough and warty as these guys do. So we have four species in the state, the oak toad down here on the right being the less common one. Uh, one of the uh, best ways to identify toads is actually looking at the patterns on their heads. And so you can see this is Fowler's toad, this is American toad, and then this is Southern toad uh, on the right. Um, Southern toad is not usually confused between the others. Well, I shouldn't say that. So they can anyone be confused with the other ones. Southern toads generally are found in the in the coastal plain, American toads, Piedmont Mountains, Fowlers all across the state. So you could get Fowlers and Southerns confused or Fowlers and Americans confused. And it comes down to these patterns on their heads. So this uh, kidney bean shaped organ that you see on the backs of their heads is called the paratoid gland. And the paratoid gland is uh, responsible for, for producing a mild toxin. And that toxin drives predators away. So if a predator grabs a toad in its mouth, it usually spits it right back out because that toxin makes it distasteful. It does not usually kill the predator or anything like that, but it is distasteful. Many of you may have seen a dog get one of these in their mouth and the dog's foaming at the mouth and clawing at its mouth, trying to get rid of that nasty taste. Many dogs learn to avoid toads because of that. Uh, I used to have a Jack Russell that never seemed to learn that. It would always pick up a toad and then spit it right back out and <coughs> do the whole thing. And then three days later, it'd do the same thing. Annoyed me, of course, since I love frogs. But anyway, uh, if you look, the, the key piece here is this ridge that's right behind the eye or the orbit. And so this is called the post orbital ridge. So this side piece here, you have the cranial crest and the post orbital ridge. How the post orbital ridge relates to the paratoid gland can help you identify which species you're looking at. In the Fowler's toad, notice that the paratoid gland and the post orbital ridge are flush with one another. So it's nice to remember flush for Fowler's, right? In the case of the American toad, that post orbital ridge may be slightly connected with a spur and you could have both of the spurs connected or it may not be connected at all like you see on this one. So that, that post orbital ridge is not flush, it's just got maybe a little piece that's connected or it may not be connected at all. Generally with the southern toad, there's a little bit of a, a connection there, but not always. But the, the more important character for it are these really large knobs at the back of the cranial crests. And you can see that nicely in this photograph. So really, really strong 
uh, knobs on the cranial crest helps us with the southern toad. So those are some things that we can use. There are other things that we use uh, as well that I'll talk about. So American toad, uh, another thing that you can use is number of spots in or number of warts in a spot. So the spot is this black pigment here, and then this is the wart in the spot. So this one has one wart in the spot. This has two warts in the spot, et cetera, et cetera. However, this gets complicated because uh, most of the things say, you know, one to three uh, warts per spot. And then if you look at Fowler's toad, it'll say three to five warts per spot. So what if you get one that averages three? So which one is it? Well, you may have to look at some additional characters. And again, on this one, you can see pretty clearly that that post-orbital ridge is not flush with the top of the paratoid gland. It has this little ridge that connects out to the side of it, even though this particular animal has a stripe down the middle of its back, like many Fowler's toads do, most Fowler's toads do. But so can American, so can Southern. You also notice uh, there can be lots of variation in the color of the animal. American toads are not always red like this one. Sometimes they're more brownish. I've had several sent to me in recent weeks that were almost solid black. So there's a lot of variation in the color, but again, very, very few number of warts per spot and looking at those orbital ridges. Those can be helpful things. Notice the range map here, principally Piedmont and mountains. Although there is this funny little Northeast coastal plain stretch of American toads, and that is accurate. They actually do go all the way to the Outer Banks. So you can get American toads out there. You will not get Southern toads out there, um, but you will get Americans, even though Southerns are in all of this re re region that you can't, you don't see anything here. So let's listen to what the call sounds like. American toads and Southern toads are somewhat similar. Uh, it's a real long, high-pitched trill. Big deep breath. <laughs> All right, now in contrast, the southern toad is going to sound like it's an octave higher than that. Almost exactly an octave. So you notice uh, most of that coastal distribution uh, for the American toad that was missing is filled in with the southern toad. There is overlap between them up here. Um, I don't think they actually get on the Outer Banks, but there is some, some overlap uh, on this northeast part of the coast between southerns and Americans. So you'd have to pay real close attention to the visual characters uh, or the call. And again, slightly different one to the other. The Fowler's toad Generally, you're gonna see a lot more warts in each one of these spots. Like you can see, these are photos that were chosen specifically because of how many uh, warts they have per spot, but there can be some variation in there. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really see the, the post-orbital ridge, but it's right about there. And you can see here that the left one, you can see, you can about almost make out that it's flush with the paratoid gland. Um, found throughout the state, uh, breeding wise, all three of these toads can be overlapping to some degree, although American and Southern tend to call a little bit earlier than Fowler's toads. Like they may start calling February, March, and then Fowler sort of pick up sort of late March, April, May, June kind of time period. But you certainly can have overlap of uh, multiple toad species calling at the same time. The calls of the Fowler's toad are very different. They're not that high, long thing. They're uh, fairly quick and more sort of a, me, I think of this as like a baby crying. All right, moving on, uh, the last two families. So this is the Microhylidae. So there's one species in this family. Eastern narrowmouth toad. 
And uh, this is one that looks maybe more like a frog, even though it has toad in its common name. It has a relative that has frog in its common name, the sheep frog. Uh, so again, those frog toad common names being a little bit confusing. Um, I've got a male and a female pictured here. So that's a male on the left, the female on the right uh, to show that here's another example of the, the throat material being different looking than, than maybe the belly does. So that can help sometimes male versus female. And uh, you can see it has a significant state distribution, but doesn't quite make it into the mountains of the state. Uh, this is a neat, neat critter. Uh, it definitely does to me sound like sheep sort of bleeding. And it always brings a smile to my face whenever I hear these. That's great comedy right there. By the way, if you ever see these out in a pond calling, they're often sort of floating, spread eagle, just kind of, you know, maybe lightly spinning a little bit in the water. And oh, just my man, that's comedy. I love it enjoyable. Uh, visually, you probably won't identify them or misidentify them as another species. They do have this really narrow uh, snout. Uh, they do actually have this fold of skin right behind their eyes uh, that is not present on any other species, so that, that can be used. But I think generally speaking, this is a species you won't confuse with, um, with others. Our final species is the spadefoot, or sometimes called spadefoot toad. Again, one that toad, frog, which is it? I don't know. But um, we're, we, uh, Eastern Spadefoot is what a lot of field guides uh, have it noted as. Uh, it does have a little bit of wartiness to it, but it also has a little bit of wet smoothness uh, that you might see on a, a frog species. Um, so, you know, different things. These guys do have a little spade on the back of their foot there. Uh, all the bouffanted toads, the true toads, also have that little spade back there, but it's not quite as well developed as what you get on the spade foot toad. Spade feet uh, will use that little claw to dig into the sand and they can actually bury themselves down in the sand fairly quickly. They spend a significant amount of time uh, buried in the sand um, during uh, much of the year, uh, throughout much of the cooler months of the year. And some years, if you have a really dry year, drought year, they may actually remain buried the entire year. Uh, they come out on really significant rain events is when they're primarily uh, really coming out as explosive breeders, as it notes here, just tons and tons of animals in spots. And they may breed in little shallow depressions that normally would not support frogs breeding. So let's listen to what they sound like. <laughs> Okay, uh, any questions that you got specifically on those species, Mike? If not, what I'm going to do is uh, come out of my shared screen and we'll uh, take a few questions here for the last uh, seven minutes or so of the workshop. And then I've got another little to... test. I've got yeah, another okay. little test after that if folks want to participate after that. Okay. Any species questions? Uh, I'm actually going to start from the from the latest one up. Um, uh, Christy wrote, I was under the impression that the American toads were no longer considered bufo uh, and now anaxorus. Yes. So uh, I didn't, you might have noted that in when my presentation when I was uh, talking, I didn't actually mention it, but um, I had bufo, parentheses, ast uh, anaxorus, asterisk, something like, I forget exactly how I did it. But anyway, uh, the reason that I haven't changed everything completely is that sometimes those names don't necessarily stick. A good example is with the group Rana. So the genus Rana was changed to Lithobates for a while, 
And then there was another paper that came out and said, no, 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 it should be run. A lithobates is wrong. Now, luckily, all those presentations that Mike and I did, I just did Rana with an asterisk, <laughs> lithobates. Uh, and then all I had to do is delete that. So if you haven't seen that information, uh, that's gone back to RANA. So it could be that the same thing will happen with Bufo, perhaps not, perhaps it will remain anax anaxorous, uh, but for now I'm, I'm, remain I'm retaining Bufo for uh, clarity and for conversation with uh, folks when they're, when they're learning these things. Taxonomy is a glimpse in time. So we're trying to learn how animals are related to one another. And so there can be name changes that occur but the important part is learning how animals are related to one another, and that helps us learn the characters that help us identify them, things of that nature. So uh, we can get down into the weeds of that uh, more, but for now, uh, I just sort of keep it uh, easy to digest and in that manner. Okay, and we've had a couple of people that had to sign off, and I wanted to mention this because I forgot to mention this at the beginning, then we'll get back to the questions. Uh, I was able to get NC Office of Environmental Education Criteria 3 credit. So all of you have my email address. Please send me an email. Don't, don't include it in the chat, but send me an email and I will make sure you get that uh, OEE form uh, in the next few days. And also I will send everybody the article uh, on the gopher frog. Uh, and, um, and I already have your email address, so no, no reason to send me the email address for that. Speaking of gopher frog, Jeff, uh, is jumpstarting altering species viability? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, it's, it is uh, because the viability of the species without us doing it is that they will go extinct. So absolutely we're, we're altering their viability because we want them to remain on the landscape. Uh, perhaps what you're saying or wondering is whether we're changing the genetics somehow or changing the uh, uh, diversity of the species but we're not. So an important part of that element is that we have to collect material from every egg mass that's deposited in the wetland. Uh, otherwise, there could be potentially bottlenecking of the species uh, based on you know, us only raising a certain group, but that's not what we do. We make repeated visits to places and we only head start in places where we know we can get access so that we can go back numerous times to make sure that we detect every egg mass uh, that's deposited in those sites. Now, is there the possibility that we miss one or two here or there? Yes, that certainly does exist, but we make a really strong effort to try to get all of the genetic representation of a wetland present. And each of those tanks that we set up outdoors is a microcosm of the larger pond. So they will have the exact same genetics as the pond does. And up to this point, we have not done any transfer of material from one population to another. We may do that. We've actually done some genetic analyses that may lead us down that path. But for now, we only augment that nature, that native population. So we take those raised frogs and we put them back at their natal pond uh, that we took the sections of egg mass from. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Okay, someone asked, is the plastic non-toxic? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, another question, is their current status related to the climb on longleaf pine forest? Uh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is it? Uh, only 3% of the original longleaf is left uh, yep. in its traditional range. And Becky asked, how long do they live? They're surprisingly long lived. Yeah. Uh, if, if we're talking gopher frogs. Yeah, yeah, gopher they, frogs. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, uh, they live eight to 15 years, somewhere in that time range uh, and possibly even longer. Um, the reason we know that, and that, that's based on some mark recapture data that was done in other parts of the frogs range, not necessarily North Carolina. So we, we know that information uh, based on those studies, but there are frogs that are marked that uh, they're still turning up. Uh, and just this past year, they had one that turned up uh, at a fence that I think was 15 years old. So who knows, maybe we'll, we'll find that animal again later. Again, this is in another state. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's uh, it should work throughout the range of the species. So that's a reasonably long lived for uh, that size animal. If you had a similar sized mammal, most smaller mammals like that, you know, they may only live one, two years, maybe three, four years. But most frogs and toads are actually much longer lived than that. Now, smaller frogs and toads may only live two, three, four, five years. But some of those larger species uh, may live five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen uh, years. 
All right, another question dealing with the gopher frog. Where and how do you put a transmitter on a frog and not interfere with the, uh, their actions? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we do is actually attach a little belt. So we use something that's uh, akin to uh, a coin purse, a change coin purse that has that little beaded loop through it. We use uh, a beaded material like that. It's actually plastic, it's not metal because that would probably abrade their skin. Um, and uh, we either use that or we use uh, a different type of, um, we've used some different plastics that are kind of like that, that have a little tube that you connect it together. So it goes around their waist and then the transmitter sits back behind them with the wire trailing off behind them. We cut the wire down to only a couple inches long. Um, so relatively speaking, uh, it's uh, it, it certainly definitely uh, uh, probably does affect their behavior to some degree, but relatively speaking, uh, it's not outside of the range of telemetry that's performed with other species. And uh, so, yeah, that's, but that's a good point. It's, a, it's a, a little bit tricky situation. You have to make sure that you get the belt on in a way that doesn't constrict the movement of the frog, but doesn't also fall off the frog, which we have both of those things happen. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not something that you just enter into lightly. You, there's a lot of considerations you have to do for sure. Okay, this one just came in. Which frog toad is it most is is most at risk or endangered in North in North Carolina? And yes, it is the gopher frog. It's probably a it's probably a toss up between the gopher frog and the ornate chorus frog. So ornate chorus frogs are also doing quite poorly uh, based on our survey information. Um, as to which one is doing the most poorly, <laughs> maybe ornate chorus frog, just because we're we're trying to do some some more things to help. Uh, gopher frogs, but ornate chorus frogs are also uh, in some significant trouble. So unfortunately, another another uh, uh, imperiled species. Okay, someone asked about the bronze frog uh, and likelihood of finding them in North Carolina. So bronze frog, I should probably throw this on that other slide. Bronze, bronze frog is a previously identified subspecies of green frog. So it's the same thing. It used to be Ranoclamatans, Clamatans, and they dropped subspecies on that on that frog. Uh, depends on what field guide you read, uh, what they call the common name. Uh, it's another reason common names can 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 be problematic. But the species that was found in North Carolina was often referred to as the bronze frog. But that's just a subspecies of the green frog. So everything I mentioned about the green frog would be uh, you could just read bronze frog when you when you say that that's the species that we have in our state okay um let me go through some of these and if you want to do a quick test um is that okay because I'm, I'm trying to scroll sure. back up to the top yeah i've got a uh, a quick test with five more species so whoever would like to participate uh let's see and then, yeah we'll answer the the remaining questions uh, when we're finished i just need to go through get through them i got you Okay, so let me remove you. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so this time it, there's, uh, I've got six frogs for you, so one through six. Same deal, I'll give you a, a sound and then I'll tell you something about where you are. You could be anywhere in the state and we'll say it's May. This is perfectly timed from the, one of the questions we had, although I'm giving it away. This is the green frog or bronze frog. You could use either of those common names. Okay. Say so Sampson County. And it's March, although the time of year. Got multiple species calling. But I'm mainly interested in this guy. If you get the other ones, we'll see. So 
southern leopard frog was the main one calling in there. Uh, other species that I heard in that uh, group were um, uh, Cope's gray tree frog, southern cricket frog, and southern chorus frog called one time. Uh, there may have been something else in there, but those are the ones I, I noticed most obviously. All right, number three. Could be anywhere in the state, April 15th. Fowler's toad. Meant to include some of the uh, visual characters as well, but you've got lots of warts per spot. A little difficult to see the post orbital ridge. I really can't see it on that photo, so I can't I can't help you with that. <laughs> but it is a Fowler's toad. All right, next one. <laughs> Keep playing. <laughs> eastern spade foot or eastern spade foot toad. Uh, you can actually see the spade on this photo uh, a lot better than you could on the other one I had. So you can see that little uh, claw like uh, projection right there. Okay. Narrowmouth toad looks giant on this photo, but uh, these guys are only about an inch, inch and a inch and a quarter, maybe inch and a half is a really big one. Uh, and you can see that fold of skin really clearly on this particular one, but that narrow snout is pretty different from most other species. Uh, I think there's one more. Say it's February and for Scythe County. Pickerel frog. Paired spots, a little bit more squared off, no real obvious spot in the middle of tympanum, at least of a different color. You notice this one actually does have a little, sort of looks like black or, or another spot, but it's, it's not cream colored or light colored in the middle. All right, and that is the frog chorus right there. <laughs> oh boy. Um, all right, Jeff, a uh, few more questions. Um, how long does it take a frog to go from juvenile morph until they are the largest they will grow? Boy, that can uh, vary a bunch. <laughs> yeah, um, so mo most, well, yeah, it, so the, the smaller frogs, they can reach adulthood within a year uh, to, to maybe two years at the, at the least amount. Um, for those larger species, it may take them a couple of years, three, four years before they reach adulthood. Um, so it kind of depends. Uh, bullfrogs may be in the tadpole stage for as many as four years. So an adult bullfrog could actually be, you know, as old as seven, eight years old um, at the first time that it's able to uh, reproduce. So uh, it, it varies a lot by species. 
Okay, uh, I have a salt water pool and have to perform frog life saving every morning in the skimmers. Is there any chance that the salt or chemicals in the water will cause the frog distress after I've set it free? Yes, that's the short answer. The longer answer is we don't really know how long uh, it probably has. There's probably a connection with length of time that the frog is exposed and uh, you know how quickly you are able to remove it from the pool water. But yeah, there definitely can be uh, complications from that. Uh, I long ago worked at a 4-H camp uh, up in the uh, Reedsville area, and I would routinely walk the pool every morning and pull all the frogs and other things out of the skimmers. And I did the same thing. I would uh, hold them in a little container of uh, stuff and release them later. Uh, I didn't ever see any mortality specifically from those animals if they weren't, if they were alive when I found them. Of course, I found dead ones in the pool at times. Uh, but yeah, if they're alive when you find them, I think there's at least some so a pretty good chance uh, of them surviving, but who knows? Okay, and I did want to mention, uh, I, I don't think we talked about this at the beginning about uh, glycol and glycogen because we've got some folks in the mountains with the wood frog and, and you know some of these others winter breeders. You want to touch on that? Yes, uh, great one Mike. Uh, so many of our species of frogs and toads call in the winter time and some of them when it's extremely cold. Spring peepers uh, call at very cool temperatures. Ornate chorus frogs I've been seen calling below 30 degrees as have wood frogs. And wood frogs uh, are probably the kings of that. Uh, they will often be calling at the edge of ponds that are completely frozen over, maybe calling and it's actually snowing at the same time. Um, uh, wood frogs are able to have about 70, 75, 80% of their body completely frozen. And that's because they are experts at converting uh, a sugar in their body, glycogen, into glycol which is the alcohol that you find in radiator fluid. So it's antifreeze. And so that helps uh, keep their body, it helps keep their cells from actually uh, being destroyed during the freezing process. So then when they thaw back out, they're not just a wad of jelly, uh, they actually survive the process. And so there are a number of amphibians that can do that uh, and do do that, but wood frogs are probably the kings at that.